Hi, my name is Greg Morgan. Um, I am a respiratory therapist by trade and I've had asthma my whole life as well. Um, one of the uh, signs that you see as you go through respiratory in the world is there's a little poster of a kid that is describing an asthma attack that says, I feel like a fish with no water. And I kind of threw that as my topic of my talk that I've now given a couple of times. Uh, Boston Scientific is sponsoring us today. Um, basically, I'm going to just go, kind of go through and talk about how debilitating asthma can be, uh, collaborating with case manager and the experience of bronchial thermoplasty. I can't breathe. Um, most people don't really understand what that means, and there's no real way to measure how severe that is for someone. Um, as an asthmatic, uh, we were kind of joking about it at dinner last night that there's the stereotype of asthmatics. There's the really thin girl who's a hypochondriac who says, oh, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And then there's the chubby person who can't breathe. With that, you know, that's something I've kind of experienced my entire life and wasn't really, found it. Uh, wasn't really sure kind of how any of that was going to go. For years, being the youngest of five kids, I wasn't able to uh, partake in sports, was always kind of discouraged from doing anything that might make you more sick. And, you know, even, even my siblings growing up never really under, fully understood what was going on with that. And the one thought that I've always had with that is imagine you're... Um, out playing on a playground and you fall and have the wind knocked out of you. Or imagine you are doing swimming lessons or something and you're swimming down to get one of those bricks to come out. And imagine that that feeling doesn't go away for hours on end and just not being able to breathe. And that's really where this kind of goes. Um, there's no feeling in the world like not being able to breathe, uh, just none at all. So I was diagnosed with asthma at about age 11. Uh, from age about 14 to 20, I was hospitalized twice a year, every year in January, uh, January or February, and then every year in August. Um, I would have either pneumonia or bronchitis. I would be in the hospital for three to five days each time, and it was a continuous a continuous process it was it was every year it was regardless it didn't matter how much I tried to prepare how much I tried to stay inside and avoid triggers it would just end up happening with the advent of uh, inhaled corticosteroids and other uh, long-acting beta agonists things like that I started to do a little bit better when I turned 20 um, through, through my uh, early 30s. And in 2006, I became a respiratory therapist and started working full-time at a hospital. Um, I hadn't actually even known what an RT was until uh, much later in life, which with all of my asthma exacerbations always kind of amazed me. But once I started working in the hospital, I started getting sick more and more often. Now, we were trying to, you know, be logical about this, and I would talk with physicians, I would talk with coworkers, and everybody was trying to figure out, well, why is this happening more? Is it because you're at work? Is it, you know, you're breathing in all of these inhaled medications? Um, you know, we don't just we don't just nebulize, you know, albuterol and things like that. We do a lot of uh, tobermycin and you know just different antibiotics and things like that that can really actually mess with people's lungs even if they don't have asthma. Um, 2007 I had four exacerbations one of which was actually in the ER that uh, I worked in quite often and I begged and pleaded with a ER physician that I knew quite well to not intubate me. Um, made it through that in 2008, it was six exacerbations. In 2009, it was eight. 
in 2010 it was nine. All of these were, you know, extreme doses of prednisone. Most of them were hospitalizations. And that kind of brought us into 2011. Um, February 28th, 2011, I will remember it forever. I actually had had allergy tests done and oh, your allergies are much worse than you were when you were a kid, so let's go ahead and you know try allergy shots. Well, six hours later, I ended up, I couldn't breathe. I wasn't necessarily having anaphylaxis. I didn't feel my throat closing off, but I knew that something was, something was wrong. I could kind of not feel normal. I got up, I started to walk to my car, I started coughing, I started wheezing, I couldn't breathe. I was telling people, no, no, don't worry about me, I'm fine, I'm just, I'm going to take myself into the hospital. I was actually with a bunch of healthcare providers who I lied through my teeth to and convinced them that I'd be just fine and found myself driving to the hospital and hardly being able to breathe and you know in a in a dead panic and it's the first time i ever remembered being in a panic over not being able to breathe admitted to the hospital um, had about 15 nebulizer treatments in less than an hour and a half uh, full dose of solumedrol eventually get admitted to the hospital and 20 hours later as i'm starting to feel better all of a sudden i start coughing and coughing and coughing and next thing you know I can't breathe I can't catch my breath I can't quit coughing um, we tried everything they had tried non-invasive ventilation with the mask with the BiPAP which I couldn't heart it actually hurt to have it on I couldn't actually cough out against it tried different things like racemic epinephrine nebs and next thing you know um, I'm being wheeled down to the e or down to the ICU because they want to be able to watch me closer. And, you know, one of the uh, people in the room was talking about, I need to be intubated, and I told them no. And by the time I went from the sixth floor on the elevator to the fourth floor on the elevator, I'm like, can you please call anesthesia? I need to, I need to be intubated. And that kind of started a horrendous experience for me. Um, I ended up on a steroid roller coaster that, uh, most people will quite honestly never ever want to dream of or be on. I would be on extreme amounts of prednisone and be doing nebs every two to four hours. Would come into work and do things like go out and see a couple of my patients and check them and you know take care of them on the ventilator and then go back to my department, do a nebulizer treatment on myself go back out, see another patient, feel a little bit worse, go do another one less than an hour apart. And every time I'd try and wean off my prednisone, I'd end up having to go up on my prednisone. From the end of uh, February in 2011 through uh, my bronchial thermoplasty that I had, I ended up, I had about 13 months where I could only work six hours a shift and I could only work three shifts a week. I had five months where they just wouldn't let me work at all. And like Daniela just talked about, I couldn't go outside. Um, I love to hunt, I love to fish, I hike, I camp, I play you know, softball and different things like that. I couldn't go outside and do anything. I couldn't, you know, she was talking about not being able to go out and get the mail. I couldn't do things like that, I actually, when I would try and work, I would actually wear a mask. I'd wear an N95 mask to get from my house to my car, from my car to work, and then do the same thing when I would try and leave when I was able to go out and go to work. I would learned about um, bronchial thermoplasty back in uh, late 2009, a few months before it got its FDA approval. Um, had learned a little bit about it and knew it was going to be a topic at an upcoming convention. So I made sure when I went to that convention, I'm going to this breakout session. I learned as much as I could about thermoplasty and started researching it myself, brought it to my pulmonologist who said, what's this? She had no idea. Um, she's, she's a wonderfully intelligent woman, but I'm one of two patients that she has that has asthma. It's not primarily what she does. 
I ended up with going through all of this after I had uh, been hospitalized uh, four times in under a year in the ICU each time on the ventilator, uh, on non-invasive ventilation a couple other times and probably should have been on a ventilator. I remember being off work and getting a call from the case manager for my insurance company. And you guys, you know, those of you who work for insurance companies, you've probably made this phone call before. Hi, I'm calling from, you know, the insurance company and I'm just wondering if there's anything that we can do to help you out with your asthma. I want to know, is there, is there anything that we can help you to make it easier for you to take your meds every day? Is there, you know, some, some different treatment that we can maybe help you provide? Is there, you know, education, you know, and I, absolutely, I would love to hear anything you can teach me at all. And as we start talking, she goes, you're a respiratory therapist? I can't tell you anything about asthma you don't already know. And I'm like, well, maybe you can. You know, I'm open to anything. So we talked for five or 10 minutes more, and then I threw bronchial thermoplasty at her. I started talking to her about bronchial thermoplasty because for two years, I had actually been trying to find someone who would do bronchial thermoplasty on me. And I was told for two years, you're too sick, you have too fast, too rapid of an onset, bronchial thermoplasty might kill you. We don't, we don't want a bronchia. Um, it, my hospital didn't do it, another one in my area did, and they had said absolutely not. My pulmonologist reached out to people and, you know, everywhere, everywhere she knew somebody that was doing this, and everybody said, no, we don't want to do it, we can't do it. So I'm talking to my case manager because my company has decided to purchase the equipment, and we have a new pulmonologist that's learning how to do bronchial thermoplasty. She had no idea what bronchial thermoplasty was. So I described it to her, we talked about it. I uh, directed her to the website that had the animation and uh, sent her some of the studies that I had read through. A Couple days later, she called me back and asked me a few more questions about it and kind of let me know what the approval process would be because this was something that you know they don't typically cover went through that process and basically she said well once you find out that this is going to happen your physician will actually put a request in we will send that to an outside vendor that we use that they'll take up to three business days to go through this and determine on a cost benefit analysis if this is worthwhile for us and she said and then it'll come back to our medical director who will have a one to five business days to decide, you know, to make a decision on this. And I said, so what are the chances that this is going to happen? And she said, he's actually really good about believing in quality of life. And if you're on everything that you're on for your asthma and you're not being able to go to work, being able to live life, being talked to about taking permanent disability and, you know, not being a productive member of society anymore. He's usually pretty good about this. I couldn't believe it. We went, that was back in May of 2012, and everything was finally lined up and ready to go at our hospital uh, right at the beginning of July. And I had an appointment with my physician, and he went through and tried to rule out all those other things that we want to look at to make sure people don't have with their asthma. and. Then he goes on vacation for a month. And I knew that was coming before we started, but I'm like, okay, at least we've got this started. And I didn't go outside. I wouldn't go outside for anything. I remember last July, actually, I was really sick at that point anyhow. For two, for two years, I never was off oral prednisone. Um, I was on, at one point, I was on up to 160 milligrams a day at home. And so I remember July last year, sitting on my couch, and that was the only thing I ever did. I would get up from my couch and I would walk up the eight stairs to get to our bathroom so I could use the bathroom and I'd go right back to the couch and I was short of breath the whole time. And pretty much that whole month, I was doing nebs about every one to two hours, 24 hours a day around the clock. I couldn't even, you know, couldn't even begin to sleep through the night. and. 
all of a sudden he comes back from vacation and yep we're approved we're ready to go uh, it was kind of funny because everybody thought well this will never get this will never get sent through well they didn't send it through before he left on vacation they sent it as soon as he got back he's like this didn't get put through oh no it needs it needed one more signature so he sends it to the insurance company it was four days later that I got a call from his office saying, hey, you've been approved for thermoplasty. And I was, I was floored because I was kind of, I wasn't in the same situation that Danielle was in, but we had talked about being in that same situation. And if the insurance company's not going to pay for this, let's go for it. And I remember uh, everybody was asking me about, well, aren't you scared? And what if it's not going to work? And what's going to happen? And I said, well, I get the risks. I get that I might not do well with this, I might not get better. You know, somebody doing a bronch bronchoscopy on an asthmatic can be uncertain doom, and that's great, but right now I'm not living life anyhow, so I didn't really see the, see the uh, difference in it. I had my first treatment on August 22nd. I remember waking up in uh, the post-op after general anesthesia and being extubated, and I was coughing a ton. I was fairly short of breath. I was wheezing a lot. Um, and I ended up, I did nebs for about a week, every three to four hours around the clock, and was coughing up a lot of sputum. I remember, I remember thinking my ribs actually in my back, the muscles in my ribs were really sore from all this coughing. And I thought, this is really what we put people through when we do bronchoscopies? I couldn't believe that. And I went through and had the second one and it was similar experience. I was really wheezy. I was a little bit more short of breath, started coughing up a little bit of blood. With the third treatment on October 15th, I was extremely short of breath. I was doing nebs every three to four hours. I was coughing up a ton of blood. And a week later, I actually felt worse a week out than I did after any of the other two procedures. And I thought, oh, this isn't good. You know, what do we got going on? That was day seven. Day eight, I felt a little better. Day nine, I ended up in the ER trying to talk. And you can get about two words out in between your breathing. And the doctor says, I, I say, I had bronchial thermoplasty. And he says, you had what? And all of a sudden, I'm thinking, here we go again. I'm explaining what this is to somebody, and I can't breathe. And it up, went way up on my steroids again. And for the next week, I did nebs around the clock. And since then, that was October 30th, uh, was my follow-up appointment with my pulmonologist. And since then... I've felt great. I actually have been back to work full time since mid-November. Uh, haven't missed any time from work for my asthma. I've been outside all the time and actually haven't had any flare-ups or exacerbations. I had one experience. I was uh, down in Florida and there was red tide, which is an algae condition, which is really bad for people with lung disorders. And I ended up we didn't know that it was still out there and we were at the beach and we were there for about an hour. I used two puffs of my inhaler, got in the car and drove away. And that's the only time I've used my inhaler at all since then. I've been exercising, not as much as I would like to be, but sometimes that's just one of those things with life. But uh, it's been truly remarkable.